morning, everybody. Um, this is obnoxious, and I apologize in advance. I am going to be the American who flies all the way to South Africa to an international education conference to talk about the future of education technology as imagined by, as invested in, as narrated by America. My intention is to sort of invert the script of what I hear a lot in the US from education technology entrepreneurs and their investors who talk about Africa. Code, I think, to them for new markets. I, uh, I want to think about the origins of ed tech looking for new markets. But really this morning I want to talk about some of the ideas and the stories about the future from California, specifically from Silicon Valley. What I hope to elicit today is how much California, the place, the concept, the dream machine, shapes or wants to shape the future of technology and the future of education. So according to my driver's license, at least, I am a Californian, although not by birth. I was born in Wyoming, and my mom is from England. So neither of those places share anything in common, politically, culturally, geographically, economically, with Los Angeles, where I live today. And I never imagined this would be my life, that I get to write about education technology, that people listen to what I have to say, that I would be invited to speak in South Africa, Sun City. And I tell you something, I never, ever imagined that I would live in LA. But I love it. I love LA. See, Los Angeles is a lot like the internet. And that makes it really fascinating for a writer and an ethnographer. The city is full of strange, bizarre, creative people. It's all about performance. It's all about fake people, some suggest, plastic people, artificial enhancements. That's not all of it, but there's a lot of it. Um, and it is, as Jean Baudrillard suggested, the hyper real. LA is more real than real. It's about the imagination and the invention of the self. It's an utterly American and totally Californian prospect. Los Angeles, that is. But also the internet. The first two nodes of what was first called ARPANET and eventually became the internet were connected in California in 1969 from the University of California at Los Angeles up to SRI International in Menlo Park. That is, from Hollywood to Silicon Valley. And I think the infrastructure and the ideology of the internet remain really Californian. In 2013, Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that he had a new organization. He called it internet.org, a partnership between Facebook and six telecommunication companies, phone manufacturers that would attempt to bring the rest, bring internet access to some five billion people on the planet who don't currently have it. In his announcement, posted on Facebook, of course, Zuckerberg said, connectivity is a human right. And he framed, as he frames this, really what he means is you have the right to participate in the economy. He wrote that the world economy is going through a massive transition right now. The knowledge economy is the future. By bringing everyone online, we'll not only improve billions of lives, but we'll improve our own as we benefit from the productivity they will contribute. Giving everyone the opportunity to connect is the foundation for enabling the knowledge economy. I think that's a really revealing definition of human rights. I'd argue, um, particularly since it's one that never addresses things like liberty, equality, or justice. Mark Zuckerberg never says joining the internet will help bring freedom of expression. He never talks about freedom of assembly. He never talks about freedom of association. You might argue that connectivity, as Mark Zuckerberg says, is sort of a shorthand for that. The opportunity to connect as a human right, I would assume, assume, 
that we're going to bring the advent of these other rights, that the internet will topple dictatorships, or for our purposes here, that the internet will democratize education. Technology critic Yevgeny Morozov has talked about this. He calls this internet centrism. This notion, he says, that permeates all of the tech industry, PR, how entrepreneurs, how investors, how politicians, and how increasingly the rest of us sort of talk about this, that the internet, he puts it in quotes, is this unchanging, autonomous, benevolent, inevitable socio-cultural development. The internet is this master framework of how all institutions are going to operate moving forward. The internet will purportedly change everything. The internet will fix everything. But of course, when Mark Zuckerberg talks about connectivity, he's not really talking about the internet as we commonly think about it. He's talking about Facebook, right? Indeed, when um, internet.org has come under fire, prefer precisely this. Several Indian companies, for example, have backed out, saying that internet.org violates net neutrality, that it privileges certain internet traffic over others. Um, this concept, net neutrality, that all traffic should be the same, that all of us should experience the same internet. But that's not what internet.org does. Although it provides free data, the, co the companies that get to participate are those approved by Facebook, right? As a founder of one of India's largest um, mobile wallet companies said, it's poor internet for poor people. So researchers have found that actually in several countries, people will say that they do not use the internet, but they use Facebook. Um, according to one survey, 11% of people in Indonesia said they use Facebook every day, but they never use the internet. 9% of people in Nigeria, same thing. 9% of Facebook users said they don't, use, they don't use the internet. So in other words, Facebook is the internet for a sizable number of people in the world. They know nothing else conceptually, experientially. Facebook wants to be the internet for everyone. And this really matters. This really matters for those of us in education in several ways. And not simply because internet.org has partnered with edX to offer MOOCs, although that's pretty significant. Facebook is really just anecdotal here, right? I want us to think about all the forces that are at play economically, politically, technologically, cultural, culturally. These matter at the level of infrastructure. These matter with who's providing, who's providing the data. Who controls the network? Who controls the servers? Who controls your personal device? Who controls the software that's installed on them? This matters at the level of ideology, too. Infrastructure, the infrastructure that we use is ideological. The internet has a particular political, economic, cultural bent to it. It is not neutral. Some of this infrastructure is built on old infrastructure, right? In the United States, waterways provided the outline upon which we mapped the railroads. Railroads provided the outline upon which we mapped the telegraph, the telegraph, the telephone, the telephone, the internet. Transportation of people, products, ideas across time and space. We're layering these on top of one another. And then there's the satellite, right? A technology that has its own history, not so much about conquering geographic space, but thinking about the conquest of space, outer space. The, the satellites, intertwined with the history of the Cold War, about control of weapons and communications. In fact, just last week, the New York Times had a headline that said, Facebook will beam the internet to Africa via satellite. A closer look reveals some online services will be made available to some African countries. In other words, free data for access to Facebook for about a fourth of the continent. Again, this infrastructure really matters. This is what we're building. We're building dist distance education on top of. In this case, this was a French satellite company and an American social network. Mark Zuckerberg's altruistic rhetoric aside, 
this is their plan. This is an economic plan, right, to monetize the world's poor. The content and the form of connectivity, they do perpetuate imperialism, and not only in Africa, but I think increasingly in all of our lives. It's imperialism at the level of infrastructure, right? Not just cultural imperialism, but a technological imperialism. And as always, imperialism is ideological. Empire is no longer simply an endeavor of the nation state. We've long had empire through technology, but now what we have is the technology industry as empire. Of course, Mark Zuckerberg is not from California. He was born in White Plains, New York. He attended the most elite boarding school in the US, the Phillips Exeter Academy, before being accepted into Harvard, where he famously built a site called Face, Face Mash, which would let students pick who they thought was the best looking person from pictures taken from the university's face books, books of containing the names and photos of everyone in the dorms. Of course, he dropped out of school in his sophomore year after he'd founded his company, and he moved to Silicon Valley. I call this the Silicon Valley narrative, and it's a story I think that the technology industry likes to tell about the world. Not necessarily the world as it is, but as the world that they want to shape. This narrative has several commonly used tropes. It often fe features a hero, an inventor, a technology entrepreneur who's smart, independent, bold, risk-taking, white, male. The Silicon Valley narrative invokes themes like innovation and disruption. It privileges new. It's anything that's deemed old is obsolete. Things are perpetually in need of an upgrade. It contends that its workings are meritocratic, that anyone who can hustle can make it. The Silicon Valley narrative has no memory. It has no history unless it invents one to suit its own purposes. The Silicon Valley narrative fosters a distrust of institutions, the government and particularly the university. The Silicon Valley narrative draws on the work of Ayn Rand. It privileges the individual at all costs and it calls this personalization. The Silicon Valley narrative does not neatly coexist with public education and we forget this at our peril. This makes education technology incredibly fraught area. I am unswayed by the arguments that technology is sort of, we're on the cusp of some sort of techno-utopia where all of our problems will be resolved thanks to connectivity. Here's the story I think we'd like to tell about EdTech. I wish we could. Um, the education technology is supportive, not exploitative. The education technology opens opportunities, it doesn't foreclose it. The education technology is driven by rethinking teaching and learning, and not simply expanding markets or expanding empire. The education technology meets both individual and institutional and community goals. But that's not really what the Silicon Valley narrative says about education. And certainly that's not what Silicon Valley investors and technology entrepreneurs want. That's not what they do. Unless they want to appeal to us as consumers, I think. But what they're really interested in is data extraction, monetization, standardization, scale. They're interested in markets. They're interested in return on investment. Education is broken, they say. Education is broken and technology will fix it. That's the core theme of the Silicon Valley narrative. Sticklers about geography will point out that Silicon Valley isn't really the most accurate description of the location where today's booming tech sector happens. Silicon Valley is just one part of the San Francisco Bay Area, the Santa Clara Valley. Its county seat, the city most commonly associated with, uh, with Silicon Valley historically, is San Jose not San Francisco, where a lot of startups are located today. Silicon Valley does include Mountain View, where Google is headquartered. It includes Cupertino, where Apple is headquartered. It includes Palo Alto, home to Stanford University, which was founded in 1885 by railroad tycoon Leland Stanford. Remember what I said, these are old networks, new networks being built on top of old networks. The term silicon refers to the silicon-based integrated chips that were first manufactured there. 
but the term Silicon Valley now extends to all the high-tech industry, not just the chip makers. As the phrase has come to sort of encompass a shorthand for the whole sector, it might not seem accurate, and not just for geographic reasons alone. I think, interestingly, importantly, it obscures the international scope of the technology industry. Tax havens in Ireland, is that Silicon Valley? Manufacturing in China, is that Silicon Valley? The Silicon Valley narrative likes to obscure and erase this. If Silicon Valley isn't quite accurate, I think that probably this notion of um, narrative is not is inadequate to. I'm really interested in the stories personally. I'm unlike my friend Tressie, she's a sociologist. I'm the literature person. I'm more interested in storytelling. The stories that we tell about the past, present, and future of tech. I'm really interested in the ways that our discursive practices sort of shape what we do, what we buy, what we think. A better term is ideology. To analyze and assess technology, I think we have to re recognize that this is ideological. Neil Selwyn says that it's a site of social struggle through which hegemonic positions are developed, legitimated, reproduced, and challenged. We tend not to see education technology as ideological. We do not scrutinize the way it can sort of, as Selwyn says, accommodate agendas from the countercultural to the commercial with little sense of incompatibility. We tend to not see technology as ideological. We ignore its connections to libertarianism, to neoliberalism, to global capitalism, and to empire. There was a wonderfully prescient essay written in 1995, 1995, just six years after the invention of the World Wide Web, by Richard Barbrook and Andy Cameron. I'm going to quote from it at length. At the end of the 20th century, the long predicted convergence of media, computing, and telecommunications into hypermedia is finally happening. At this crucial juncture, a loose alliance of writers, hackers, capitalists, artists from the west coast of the USA has succeeded in defining an orthodoxy for the coming information age, the California ideology. This new faith has emerged from a bizarre fusion of cultural bohemianism of San Francisco with the high-tech industries of Silicon Valley, promoted in magazines, books, TV programs, websites, news groups, and the net. The California ideology promiscuously combines freewheeling spirit of the hippies and the entrepreneurial zeal of the yuppies. This amalgamation of opposites has been, has been achieved through a profound faith in the emancipatory appeal of new information technologies. In the digital utopia, everyone will be both hip and rich. The widespread appeal of these West Coast ideologies isn't simply a result of their infectious optimism. Above all, they are passionate advocates of what appears to be an impeccably libertarian form of politics. They want information technologies to be used to create a new Jeffersonian democracy where all individuals will be able to express themselves freely on in cyberspace. By championing these ideals, these techno boosters are at the same time reproducing the most atavistic features of American society, especially those derived from the bitter legacy of slavery. Their utopian vision of California depends upon a willful blindness to the other, much less positive features of life on the West Coast. Racism, poverty, and environmental destruction. Ironically, in the not too distant past, the intellectuals and artists of the San Francisco Bay Area were passionately concerned about these issues. California, California, the promised land. It's the end of the road of the US westward expansion. It's the fulfillment of my country's manifest destiny. It is colonization upon colonization, the gold rush, the construction of an invented palm tree paradise. California includes geographically, ideologically, Hollywood and Silicon Valley. California is media plus technology. 
both of which export their products globally. California, it is the center of this new computer and communications empire and a center of the old empire as well. The power of Hollywood, Hollywood has not been displaced, even though Silicon Valley talks about disruption. California also produces two thirds of the United States produce. Over a third of the nation's farm workers live in California, 95% of them born outside the US. The California ideology ignores race and it ignores labor and it ignores the water supply. It is sustained by air and fantasy. It is built upon white supremacy and imperialism as is the tech industry. Here's another story about California. Um, one specifically this time about higher education. It might be that the beginning of the end of public education as we know it has er, roots before Silicon Valley's latest tech explosion. Before they started predicting that thanks to MOOCs there would only be 10 universities left in the world. We could tie it, according to Aaron Beatty and Mike Poxall, to the governorship of Ronald Reagan in the 1960s who vowed he would clean up that mess in Berkeley. At the time, the state had developed what some historians call a utopia for higher education. The pinnacle of this was called the Master Plan for Higher Education, signed into law in 1960. It was a commitment to provide all Californians with, a free, with free access to higher education, something uh, that, as Tressie has pointed out, was really a cornerstone of how we viewed class mobility. The master plan was meant to offer access to everyone to have college. The top 12.5% of high school graduates could attend the UC system, say at Berkeley or LA, for free. The top third were guaranteed a spot at one of the state campuses, Cal State, San Francisco State, for free. Any high school graduate, anyone who was interested in higher education could attend a community college for free, for free. When Reagan took office as the governor of California, he made it really clear. Public expenses would be curbed, particularly at the university. He said, there are certain intellectual luxuries we can do without. He said, taxpayers should not subsidize intellectual curiosity. The purpose of college, in other words, is not to argue what was sort of talked, called the liberal arts education, the purpose of higher education, job skills. The tech industry is really just the latest to latch on to this argument. Everyone should learn to code, we now hear. The state of California elsewhere has withdrawn its financial commitment to public education since then. And who has stepped in to meet the demands? The for-profit sector. The tech industry is now latching onto this market as well. So far this year, some $3.76 billion in venture capital has been invested in education technology, a record setting figure. And that money will change the landscape. That's the hope, that's the intent. The money carries with it a story about the future, a story about the future of education, and it carries with it ideology. One last story about California. This is a map, a proposal, a failed proposal, thankfully, by a venture capitalist named Tim Draper to split the state of California into six separate states. Jefferson, North Carolina, or North Carolina, North California, Central California, Silicon Valley, West California, South California. The proposal, he tried to collect enough signatures to put this on the ballot, would have created the richest state in the country, Silicon Valley. It would have created the poorest state in the United States, poorer than Mississippi, Central California. Now Tim Draper is not a particularly active VC in education technology. He is the founder of Draper University of Heroes, an unaccredited for-profit venture that teaches innovation and entrepreneurship. You can take a seven week immersive program to inspire and train heroes, according to the website. Heroes who will pay $10,000 so they can learn to be tech 
startup founders. Draper University is also the subject of a reality TV show because of course it is, because it's California. Tim Draper's unconstitutional plan to split up the state of California would have completely reshaped American politics. It failed, but it underscores the sort of transformative vision, the Silicon Valley narrative, the California ideology that the tech industry has. And this vision is not simply about the virtual world. We in education would be naive, I think. That the designs of venture capitalists and tech entrepreneurs would, that they have for education would be any ra less radical than creating a new state. A state like the state of Silicon Valley, which would have been enormously wealthy and politically powerful. When I hear talk of unbundling in education, which is one of the latest gerunds that you'll hear venture capitalists and ed tech entrepreneurs invoke, unbundling, the dismantling and dissembling of public institutions, outsourcing, dividing them up into small pieces that can be productized and sold back to us. I can't help but think of the unbundling that Tim Draper wished to do to my state. Carving up land, carving up resources, shifting the tax revenue, shifting the tax burden, creating new markets, privatizing public institutions, redistributing power, redistributing it in such a way, not in the service of equity and justice, but in the service of venture capital. This is echoes of imperialism to me. This is imperialism's latest form. And this is the ideology. It's our responsibility, I think, to recognize that this is a powerful story. And when a venture capitalist says that software is eating the world, we can, we should push back on that. It's not inevitable that they eat us. We can resist, I think, but not in the name of sort of sort of clinging to the old, what we're often accused of doing in education, that we don't want things to change. We want things to change. We want to, we must resist, I think, in the name, as sort of Tressie talked about yesterday, in the name of freedom and justice, and a future that isn't dictated by the wealthy white men in Hollywood or Silicon Valley. That does not have to be our dream machine. This invented California, this California invention. We can do better, and I think we must.